So you guys are fortunate. I, I started out this morning with about 110 slides because I knew people would cover some of the stuff that I had. I got down to one. <laughs> so I had to add a few in, So, uh, but we'll, we'll do okay here. So, so what I'm going to try to talk a little bit about is sort of uh, the pragmatics. Uh, and you know, we've heard a lot about the hard work that people are doing on all different fronts to try to try to move interoperability forward. And so I was going to try and share a few thoughts about sort of what works, what doesn't, and, and where we might go. And so uh, this stupid little diagram is intended to try to capture the notion that a lot of the discussion today has been focused on sort of EHR to EHR and EHR to HIE and PHR kind of interoperability. But, but I think it's important to remember that there's a lot of interoperability in healthcare that has to happen that happens between other systems that are out there. And in fact, the way that we get a lot of data into those EHR, PHR, HIE systems is through other means because that's not been the focus and emphasis. And you heard that throughout the last session, for example, there were comments about uh, you know, uh, high tech doesn't fund labs to do this and public health doesn't have it, and so on. So, so there's a whole host of other pieces of interoperability that are probably at least as important for us to think about as we go forward because uh, it's where a lot of the structured data and, and sorts of things come from. And, uh, and, the, and it's not just between these uh, sort of different categories of systems, but within them as well that, that's just as important. So as we try to go down this journey of interoperability, I think that uh, it's helpful sometimes to think about how, how you move there, and, and there's different ways to think about this, but um, one notion is that there's different models of change, things that will precipitate, and, and three that some people talk about. One is a crisis, it's like Pearl Harbor. Uh, you know, there's some sudden thing that causes fundamental change, and to a degree, high tech played a little bit of that role for us, but as we're seeing it play out, um, it's not quite that. It's not that crisis we do something dramatically reactive and, and move forward. The second model is more of a tipping point model where pressures continue to build and there's an inflection point and things will begin to change. And those pressures could be a whole variety of things uh, that might lead to that. And then there is uh, glacial erosion that you just keep slogging away at it. It's a steady growth, grinding, inexorable, hard to resist pressures of a whole variety of kinds. And, and frankly, I think that's what's gonna drive interoperability is those kind of glacial forces. And there's a variety of them. There, there's uh, consumer pressure, there's payment reform, you know, a whole variety of things like that that are gonna slowly but inexorably drive us in that direction but it's not gonna be fast, and it's not gonna be flipping a switch, and it's magic, and we'd all like that, but that's just not the way it's gonna work, and part of the reason it's not gonna work that way is our fragmented, diverse healthcare system, or non-system, uh, uh, but, but also the fact that it is just very expensive and very hard to do this work, as many of you in this room know who've been doing it, it's not like there's something you can do and gee, it all gets better because we're changing a, a very large, very complex, uh, complex adaptive system. The other thing that makes it hard, and some of you are familiar with this idea of fractals, but fractals are these mathematical constructs that no matter what scale you look at them on, they look the same. So if you blew this up a thousand fold, it would look exactly the same. And if you zoomed out a thousand times, this figure would look exactly the same. And, and the, the reason for putting this up is it seems to me that when we talk about interoperability, it's like fractals. You, you, you get started and you think you whip the first layer of things, but as soon as you get below, you get that down, there's another layer of things and another layer of things and another layer of things that you have to deal with to really make it work and really make it work well. And that's one of the other reasons I think it's going to be a, a, a drawn out process because we're going to solve a layer of issues and there's many more layers of issues that we're gonna to have to get to in order to be successful. So there are um, you know, a lot of discussion today about uh, some of the different models and, and approaches that are out there, and there was at least one mention of some of the data from uh, the Mickey Tripathi presented this, uh, this January to the HIT Policy Committee about the volume of interoperability, or at least the best shot at that if you can. Uh, and if you look at query-based exchange, and this is just broken out by states, 
But I think the useful thing to look at in this particular slide is sort of the numbers. So, so in uh, Indiana, for example, in 2012, there are 350,000 query transactions that were done um, as part of healthcare operations. And you know, the next one is 215,000 or so, and it obviously gets small very quickly. So, you know, there's a real volume of query-based transactions happening. So this is sort of like the uh, William Gibson quote, you know, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Uh, and, and people are doing this kind of query-based interoperability, having tackled at least some of those very complicated issues that a lot of the speakers were talking about today related to arts of trust, as David was talking about, about some of the liability questions that uh, Walter Sransky was asking about. Uh, they have been solved in microcosms, sometimes in special cases, sometimes just by luck, sometimes by hard work, but it, but it clearly shows that it's possible. We sort of have this existence proof. I also wanted to look briefly at the data from that same presentation on what was called directed exchange, and this goes back to Will's point uh, earlier. But when you look at these numbers, you go, holy cow, there's uh, Indiana, for example, had 14.5 million uh, directed uh, exchanges in 2012. Pretty good, huh? How many of those were a CDA? Zero. And in California, al almost the same, I think. But I don't know what the breakout is. But so the practice, so one of the things that I think uh, I'll come back to is that this is a journey. It's not something that's going to happen in, a, in a, a consistent, coherent way everywhere, but rather be an evolution. And uh, so I want to spend the, the next few minutes just thinking a little bit about what works. So for example, secure pipes work. You, you, we heard a lot from speakers about you know, certificates and all kinds of things. Good stuff, right? Where is the volume of data exchange today and how is it happening? You know, if you go to the ONC dashboard and you look at, uh, it's kind of interesting, if you go to the ONC dashboard as I did yesterday and you try to look at health information exchange data, the only thing they present is e-prescribing data. And how do SureScripts connect to their e-prescribers, VPNs? How were those 15 million transactions in Indiana managed? All VPNs. Will described in his uh, remarks earlier today the magic box, I forget what you call it, the plug, HA plug, uh, which is all VPN. Uh, so, so there are well-established solutions out there that folks understand, can use, and work that are not, don't necessarily require the same level of complexity and sophistication as some of these other solutions. The second thing I think that there's ample evidence that, that begins to show uh, works is organization to organization trust relationships. What I mean by that is that I think we are all finding it very challenging if you try to go the next layer down and talk about individual to individual trust. In all cases, you seem to land on the same solution which is I gotta have somebody who aggregates that trust, who actually knows who the providers are and what they do and, and those sorts of things. Uh, in David Kibbe's presentation, for example, he talked about HISPAE, you know, having relationships to its members, and I think he even said BAA is with them and so on, because that's what you have, you have to have somebody who does that work. In Indiana, for example, it was, it was always fascinating to me, the laboratories, for example, would send results to docs, and, and then we, tracked down, it couldn't be delivered, and we'd track it down, turn out the docs in prison, you know? <laughs> and it's like, we're the first people to know it in the Indian Health Information Exchange because we're actually trying to follow up and connect to them. But, but that kind of uh, maintenance and uh, relationship almost has to happen at a local level. Uh, the other example is, how do you know that this is a credible healthcare organization, even at the HISP level? And, in Indiana, we actually had, a, get, is it, you know, as an example, I think Walter Saransky's group, you're doing similar things. Not only when somebody applied to, to be a trusted entity, not only did you fill out some stuff and find out who they were and what their official name was and you know, who their representative was, but somebody would go there and look around and say, well, are there people here with old magazines waiting to see the doctor? Okay, that's a good sign. Uh, you know, where there were exam rooms, you know, was there a stethoscope somewhere in sight? Well, you begin to get a level of competence. But even there, you can sort of be fooled. Uh, it's a very tricky thing, and it's certainly a tricky thing to maintain over time. 
you know, what happened to that organ? Well, it's sold, it's acquired. It's, I mean, the, these transactions are happening very frequently and it's a very complex thing to track them and maintain that information over time, particularly at the individual level, but even at the level of practices and hospitals and so on. Another great example in Indiana was uh, one of the hospitals, Northern Indiana Emergency Room, closed. The first, the very first indication of that was they quit sending HL7 registration messages. That was the first time anybody in the state knew that that ER was closing, because the hospital didn't tell anybody until they shut the doors. And so, you know, the, it, it's very tricky to know these things. The third thing that, so, so doing things at the organization level where there's an organization that can provide the confidence, the connectivity to the individual and so on is very important. The third thing is, is I, I think thoughtful prioritized mapping works. Uh, we all wish it was magic and you heard a lot today about the challenges of uh, provider A uses different terminology than provider B and so on and in most cases where there is exchange happening that's been managed through I won't say an army, but it feels like an army most of the time of mappers who are manually going through and do this. And, and then there's a couple of tricks, and Dan Bremen and Clint McDonald from the Reagan Street Institute have done some nice work, for example, at showing that, well, golly gee, if you look at a few hundred concepts, uh, you'll actually get the vast majority of the patient data. In fact, it's on the order of 99% of all patients will have 99% of all their data mapped. If you do, I think it's the 400 most common concepts for labs. So you don't have to map all 5,000 concepts. You just have to know which of the 5,000 you need to map, but that's another, another challenge. And, there, and there's progress on this front, for example. There's um, small companies who are doing a nice job of evolving the automation of that. So clinical architecture, for example, is a company that does some lexical analysis for mapping, and they can automate about 70% of the mapping task uh, with pretty high reliability. So people are starting to get some tools and progress, even the LOINC uh, realm, I shouldn't say even, the Link Roma mapper doesn't do too badly. It's sort of 50, 60 percent or you know higher. We'll have it in the top two or three in the list. So this thoughtful prioritized mapping actually works. You can get enough stuff mapped to be useful and carry forward. The fourth thing is, and this goes back to Will's point, HL7 version two works. The vast majority of the data being exchanged in this country today is being exchanged using that protocol. And that's just the realities of things. So it works, it's good enough for a large number of purposes. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. The last thing on my what works list before I go to the what's still hard list is uh, patient matching. And while it's certainly not perfect, and you know, there were folks earlier today who said, golly gee, if we just had that national identifier, life would be easier. And, and that's true to an extent, but it's certainly not a perfect solution. If you go to the UK, for example, where they have a national provider identifier, most practices don't use that as the way to identify the patient. It is an attribute of the patient. It is not the way you identify the patient. And you run into all the usual problems of errors in the numbering, people who don't have identifiers, uh, the fact that people have multiple identifiers, all of those things happen in every country that has a, a single identifier. But the good news is, is that would be helpful, it would be good to have, and it would help with matching but you can do a very good job of probabilistically matching together patients with high confidence. You're gonna have some holes, you're gonna miss some data in doing that, but it is good enough, and again, we have existence proofs of a variety of organizations around the country who are doing that routinely day in, day out, and successfully uh, navigating the issues of patient matching. So what's still hard, uh, long list? Uh, comprehensive matching and, or mapping and maintenance and I mentioned maintenance specifically because this is a place I think a lot of people uh, trip up. You know, you, you do all this hard work, you hire a contractor and you get all this stuff and you map the laboratory results or the clinical results. Guess how many of them turn over next year? Uh, I think it's something like a third of the values will change next year and the year after that and the year after that. So this is not a one and done task, but rather an ongoing annuity or the vendors that are doing your mapping. Uh, but, it, but it really is an ongoing thing. Now I think there's evolution that will get us out of that box over time, but it's still hard to map comprehensively and it is hard to maintain it and recognize when it needs to be maintained in a, in a long-standing way. A second area is harmonized value sets that is still hard, although I think Chris Shute gave us some good examples of 
where that is really beginning to be solved. We're seeing increased consistency. There's still nuttiness in different places, and you look at the clinical quality measures from CMS and things like that, and there's still nuttiness in places, but it's gradually becoming better aligned and easier. The third one, and I think this is one of the places that, that we keep uh, being challenged, is uh, I, I called it understanding multiple information models. But what I really mean is, is people look at HL7 version 2 and they say, ugh, that's really hard. And then they look at the CDA and they say, ugh, that's really hard. And they look at the net, you know. And so then we, all, we come up with other alternatives. But part of the reason that I think it seems so hard is that they have a mental model of how their system, their EHR or PHR, whatever it is, works, and the other things have their own <laughs> mental model. And now this poor developer, who's probably not a clinician, is trying to figure out how to translate and map those, and it's a lot of work. And so that is still hard. A somewhat related issue, and again, Chris talked about this some, um, is the problem of translating the information models, largely pre and post coordination, but other things as well that, that are still uh, an ongoing challenge. The last couple things are sort of getting out of the traditional, well, we just need better standards uh, kind of area into some of the more challenging things, but provider matching. And there was a little bit of discussion about this in the last session. But providers have many identifiers, unfortunately. Uh, we have national ones. They're not used by everybody. Uh, trying to find the right Clement J. McDonald in Indianapolis, there are two, uh, can be tricky. <laughs> uh, you, know, you wouldn't think that there'd be two Clement J. McDonald's. Uh, other names that come up. So, so physicians have many of the same issues that patients have with matching. And, and uh, that, that can be a tricky thing. And that's convoluted with the next item, which is location identification. You know, locations are a slippery problem in our current world. And so, for example, SureScripts, as a provider, you get multiple identifiers in SureScripts, one for each location where you practice. And they do that for very good reasons. But the who you are, if I want to get you a message, and the convolution of that with the where do you practice, and laboratories have the same issue, create a lot of problems with routing and, and proper identification and delivery of data uh, to the provider. And locations are a very tricky thing. Uh, most organizations are not very consistent about tracking and identifying organizations. You run into all these sorts of things about um, uh, you know, the practice was called Greenwood Clinic and now it's called North Meridian Clinic because they moved across the street and they, it's got a different address or whatever. We don't have good identifiers at all for organizations. So when you have these trust relationships and so on and you say, well, how do we identify the physician practice? What's it called? Well, it used to be Zionsville Pediatrics and now it's IU Health Zionsville and now it's called, you know, the names change, the players stay the same. The physical locations change, the players stay the same or sometimes change. And so that complexity of where are the locations is one, this is getting back to the fractals, uh, that we really haven't wrestled to the ground yet because it's just, it's sort of lying there waiting for us to get closer to. And the last thing on my what's still hard list, and you heard folks talking about this throughout the day, is federation of trust relationships. And uh, just as you talk through, and I listen to David talking about the work that they're doing, for example, and I go, holy cow, you know, the, the layers and the evolutions that we're going through, and many of you have uh, lived through some of these things of trying to evolve. How do we do that? What are the agreements? What are the principles that go behind us? That's still hard work for us to do. So in the last uh, slide, I want to talk about four sort of take-home points. I think what I would argue is we're in a position to make good progress on interoperability today. There is nothing in our way. We may not be able to do it as prettily and as nicely as we would like, but here are my four things. First of all is avoid bright, shiny objects. Uh, we all like bright, shiny objects, uh, but they don't solve the problem. And so what I mean by that is, so what do we do when HL7 version 2 was hard? Well, we invented the CCD. Cool. Uh, you know, easy to read, XML, all that good stuff. So it evolves and we start actually trying to use it and we get all these neat things that we need to do and all of a sudden it's very complicated and hard to read and understand. So now we go on and we start looking at the next thing and so on. 
it is always easy to say, well, there must be a better way. This is just too hard. And so we look for those bright, shiny objects that will, uh, will take us forward. Another example that is direct, I think, to a degree. You know, direct, we thought, oh, man, that's going to take care of it. I mean, good principles, good ideas of, of simple interoperability. But then, as David, I think, very nicely described, you start trying to actually do it, and all of a sudden, it's starting to look like the DURSA agreements and the complexity. I mean, not quite, but it <laughs> starts to feel almost as difficult as, as the work that was done on the nationwide health information network and the connect and all those sorts of things. So avoid bright, shiny objects and just take what you have and work with it forward. The second one, uh, going around clockwise here, is it's trench warfare. Uh, and what I mean by that is that we have an entrenched set of systems. They're not gonna change by and large, right? Uh, I was talking to a uh, health system the other day and they were looking at, at changing their EMR system and their estimate when they got all done was $4.2 billion. They decided to try something else. <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, this is a very real issue, especially when you look at all the folks who've invested recently and so on. But even more importantly, even uh, and somebody made the comment before about uh, terminologies and so on, you know, every implementation is unique. There are no two Cerner implementations that are alike. There are no two Sorian implementations that are alike when you get down to the end of it. So it's going to be one by one, door to door, trench warfare to build interoperability. I mean, many things, and Clem talked about this, for example, earlier, the message details, you can sort the message structural details out in hours. Those, those are not terribly hard. But the issues around content and models and security and privacy are going to continue to be one by one by one. Now, it's still a good idea to do it in a, not in a, you know, the diagram that everybody shows, spaghetti bowl, but in a common way. That's going to be much easier, but it's still one by one by one. And that sometimes gets frustrating, takes time, takes resources, and people all go, well, why can't this go faster? Why isn't there just the, sort of this tipping point? Well, because there's work to be done at each one. Bottom left, embrace mediocrity. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is that it's I just see people over and over and over again going, oh man, we've just got to solve all these 152 problems and then we can be interoperable. Well, guess what? There's a whole lot of very useful, very powerful data that could be interoperable today that could be helping patients. And we're waiting and waiting and waiting because we want to deal with the how many angels dance on the head of a USB key uh, in, in order to move forward. And whether that's issues related to, well, this data is not good enough for public health, or well, this data doesn't include you know, patient reported outcomes, so we can't do it. It's really important not to get caught up and, and try to be perfect, but rather to move forward. So embrace mediocrity. And the last is don't trip on the long tail. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, I think most of you are probably familiar with the notion that many, many things in, in healthcare, and in fact, the principle that the internet is based on, and much internet commerce is based on, is that there's this very long set of things that you might have to worry about. And what the internet does is it lets you aggregate those in some way. It doesn't work that way in healthcare, unfortunately. So you really have to focus on the head, on the high volume portion of things. And, and that involves doing things like being intelligent about which sets of terms you try to map and bring together because it's just too costly, too hard to do them all. So do the set that gets you 99%. It's the same thing about which organizations do you spend that time in trench warfare on? Well, you take the high volume ones, guys. Uh, you know, the laboratories that produce a lot of data, the physician practices that get you 200 providers instead of the ones that get you two. Not that those aren't important to get the ones that get you to, but you need to get to the scale that gets you the network externalities and creates the value in order to move forward. So my last note is that, and, and this actually is a slide from a, a hospital in Indianapolis that has a nationally known uh, electronic health record, uh, deeply embraced uh, the use of clinical data, of barcoding, of drug administration, and so on. And the, the woman here's uh, infant son had died the night before in the ICU from a heparin overdose uh, because the data didn't flow properly between the systems. 
And uh, I just think we've got to keep driving forward with what we can do today because our patients are waiting. So thanks very much.